don't know exactly where I am. Don't know what libertarians are, if you are libertarians. Uh, I consented to come here because of the workings of supply and demand, however. I was in demand and asked if I could have $500, and if I could, then I would come. So here I am. Uh, I don't mean to commercially exploit you, uh, uh, nor uh, do I have any intention of attempting to persuade you. Uh, I just uh, would like to tell you uh, uh, what I think is going on, and if you relate to my reality, you'll get into it. And if we're in other realities, you'll be like a visitor from another planet, which uh, is also sometimes uh, an interesting part of experience. I was asked uh, to talk about what, it, what the future of freedom is. Uh, first of all, uh, it seems to me the key uh, will be whether or not we continue to honor the spirit of rebellion in the United States because the consciousness of the need for freedom is the greatest guarantee. And we have a tendency in this country, as you know, to honor our rebels after they are dead and not while they're living. To study their works about 40 years after uh, they were relevant. Uh, to build them monuments uh, about a century too late. And to shun them or fear them or have trepidation or anxiety when we are in their presence because the nature of rebellion on any level, just simply on the level of rebelling against the cliché, has to be disturbing. And in starting to become acquainted with new ideas, we at the same time become disturbed by them. And so we often wind up accepting the ideas while rejecting the people who had them. And then opportunists come along and steal the ideas and then we always wonder why those ideas didn't become part of reality or part of law. Why is it that the people in office paid lip service to those ideas? Well, I think it's because the people in office are generally opportunistic people who take ideas when those ideas have gone from being radical or uh, unusual or controversial to becoming more and more acceptable. And that's a problem that uh, I would like to see broken. I think that in each uh, generation, secondly, the question of rebellion also has to be directly linked to the question of authority, what you're rebelling against. Some generations rebel against the king. Some generations rebel against political exclusion. Some generations rebel against discrimination on the basis of some kind of stigma. And this process of democratic rebellion leads to changes in consciousness, changes in law, changes in our country's mores and institutions. But the concept of rebelling against authority in behalf of democracy always shifts its focus with the times. So what's the problem of tyranny today? in our country, in our state, at this moment. Uh, I would suggest that the problem of tyranny today is the tyranny of economic monopoly. Giant banks and corporations with ha which have multinational power, which have grown to be in a position above and beyond and outside of the law and democracy. When 1% of the American people have 50% of the stock, when 50 banks have 50% of the deposits, when 200 manufacturing companies connected with those 50 banks are in control of two-thirds of our manufacturing assets, you have tyranny. And when that economic tyranny is buttressed by a government that colludes and coincides and overlaps with the economic powers, you have a twin tyranny of big government and big business. That's our situation today. It's grown over the years from small family farms, relative economic uh, freedom, to monopolies, 
monopolies in the 19th century were met by the forces of the time, by a labor movement, by consumer movements, by movements that tried to bring about antitrust and regulatory laws, but it seems to me that all of those have failed, and we're now uh, in very, very serious need of eliminating or going beyond most of our uh, uh, economic doctrines to try to grapple with this new reality. There's a dream on the left, for example, a vision on the left that's become a cliche, that we can deal with this economic power and this economic might by simply uh, establishing a system of socialism or democratic socialism. The problem with this notion, of course, is that it compounds state collectivism with economic collectivism and doesn't guarantee democracy. There's a dream of the center, the moderate to liberal center, that's become a cliche, that through uh, efficient use of the antitrust laws, through the use of regulatory commissions, through the different devices that are proposed by the advocates of countervailing power and political pluralism, that the power of the giant multinationals can always be counteracted by this checks and balances kind of system. But, of course, the reality is that the antitrust laws have not worked. They've been, at most, kind of a way to re-slice the baloney, to divide a giant into seven giants, which then re re uh, regroup. Uh, or they've been used to expose things without changing them. The regulatory commissions, as you know, have been taken over basically by people from the industries that they were supposed to regulate. Uh, so the moderate liberal centrist theory of how to cope with this problem of vast economic power, I think, is also a failure. Of course, there's also a dream on the right that's become a cliché, and that's to return to the free market system. That's to return to small-scale, purely competitive free enterprise. The problem, of course, with this dream is the fact that it would be like taking a movie that we're now in, running it backwards, then turning it on, and it would run forward. Since the purpose of competition, in my opinion, is to create monopoly. The purpose of competition is to drive the other competitors to the wall. The purpose of comp competition is to defeat your opponent. So it's in the nature of competition to rewind into monopoly, then be broken up and rewind into monopoly, and be broken up and rewind again. So it seems from what I'm saying, we can't stay where we are, and we, do, we can't go forward, and we can't go backward. What's the answer to this problem? I think that uh, it's the task, really, of a great many people, and maybe some of them in this room, to contribute to the kind of thinking that we need to find an answer. I don't come to you with the blueprint or cliches, but the direction that I would take, the avenue that I think is the most important, and I speak here politically and as a human being rather than as an economist, which I'm not, is that we would be best served by sticking with democracy. That the standard by which I judge things is whether or not they are democratic whether or not the policies that we're talking about benefit a majority of people or only a privileged few, whether or not the policies that we're talking about have been discussed by a majority of people or whether they've been handed to that majority by an elite, whether the policies, whatever they are that we're talking about, are policies uh, that encourage participation by people in the decision-making process or whether the policies drive people out. What I think we have to do, in other words, is strengthen democracy and start applying the Bill of Rights to future areas that are still areas that lack democracy, in particularly our economic arena, our energy arena, and our foreign policy arena. We have something of a political democracy almost a 
kind of universal suffrage. There's a lot to be done about the political process, to be sure, to make it more democratic. But what I would like to suggest is that there are ways to extend the Bill of Rights and the ideas of democracy to other arenas. Start asking what it would be like for the workers, both in the private or public sector, to have a voice in the conditions of their work instead of working with great insecurity in the midst of giant bureaucracies. To ask what it would be like to have a decentralized solar energy system instead of a fossil fuel energy system that requires the giant utilities and oil companies with the federal bureaucracy to control our energy destiny. Whether or not it's possible to have the government act as a lending authority to small businesses, whether they are right-wing Orange County people that we're in touch with or hippies in Mendocino, there are solar entrepreneurs throughout the state of California who know how to develop immediately solar energy, heating systems, water heating and space heating systems, but really lack only one thing, and that's capital because they are prevented from access to capital by both the government and the private bureaucracies of the utilities. And so we're in danger of having the sun, which falls on rich and poor alike, on all continents and on all the seas, suddenly transformed into a privately owned phenomenon in the hands of utilities who have invested in liquefied natural gas and other fossil fuel futures, which means they have a vested interest in slowing down the introduction of solar energy for at least 25 to 50 years. It could be done now if we applied the standard of democracy to our energy policies. In foreign policy, it's all too obvious that we have been living for a long time with a foreign policy that we either fought or died for or paid for, but never knew anything about. It's a foreign policy in which the representatives of the State Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Pentagon, overlapping with representatives of the giant banks and corporations, meeting in places today like the Bilderberg Conference in Europe or the Trilateral Commission, are concocting their schemes for how to maintain the division of wealth on the planet. And we will have to be conscripted to fight their wars. And ge generations later on, we'll find out why, and what it was all about. So applying the standard of democracy to foreign policy, it seems to me, is a very important, very important step that the country has to take. Because I think if we had a foreign policy that was open, democratic, and that people had a right to comment on and say something about before it happened, there would not have been an Indochina war. There would have been the sparing of our people of the loss of 60,000 people, 500,000 wounded, 1 million Indochinese people killed, billions of dollars wasted, and our national state of mind thrown into guilt, confusion, despair, and loss which will not be restored by any payments or talk of peace with honor. So these are the areas that I think we have to begin to consider. To take the ideas of the Bill of Rights to a new frontier of the economy, energy policies, and foreign policy. To recognize that the tyrants today are economic monopolies to recognize that there are cliches left, right, and center that do not offer us real guidance about how to deal with these problems, but that only the reawakening of some grassroots citizens movement that puts the quality of life first and thinks of entrepreneurialism in terms of producing and working for the good of society rather than for the good of absentee owners of capital who live in Tokyo, or New York or Houston is the only possible avenue forward from the combined tyranny 
that government and the giant corporations today represent. Thank you very much. I would like to start my talk uh, by a quote from Mr. Hayden's campaign material for his senatorial race. Uh, not because I think it's a particularly evil or ridiculous quote, but only because it states a rather fundamental problem of political institutions. And I think what bothers me about what he's been saying uh, is that he knows what outcomes he wants, and he has a peculiar idea that the institutions called democracy, if they're institutions at all, uh, will produce it. Uh, the quote is, we have no say over fundamental economic decisions. Now, the problem which this raises is that most fundamental economic decisions affect more than one person. Uh, for instance, my decision to come here and speak to you affected both me and you. And there is no way that both of us can have an absolute say uh, over whether or not I come and speak to you. Uh, I can have an absolute say, in which case you have no say over that particular fundamental decision, a very minor one, but a decision nonetheless. Or you can have, some one of you, uh, Dana Rohrabacher, could have the absolute say, in which case I'm his slave, and I have no say over it. We can't both have it. Uh, now, there are two ways of resolving this problem, this situation. One of them, which I would perceive as the libertarian way, is to say, I have the absolute say over what I do with my body, uh, with goods I have produced, and so forth. And there are all sorts of difficult uh, philosophical questions, to some of which I don't have very good answers about privatizing land and so forth. And if Tom and I had 15 hours to argue about it, we might say something useful. Uh, but just start out with me, because most libertarians agree that I belong to me. Uh, you have similarly similar property over you. If I want to use what you own, I've got to make you an offer you're willing to accept, and similarly if you want to use what I own. Uh, and in that system, in one sense, uh, I have fundamental control over the decision that most concerns me, but there is a huge range of decisions which affect me enormously. What kinds of clothes are produced, what kinds of jobs are available, uh, and so forth, which really depend on other people's decisions, and over which I am powerless. It's unfortunate. It would be very nice to live in a world in which I could control everything, but if I did, nobody else could, and so it happens to be, you know, a, a circumstance of the human condition. Now, there appears to be a way out of it, and I think this is the way that Tom thinks he believes in, though I may be wrong, and it's called democracy. Uh, and, and that way is, well, the sense in which I'll control everything is I get one vote. Uh, there are about 500 of you, one of me, so we have a vote on whether I'll come. And I suppose the vote would include whether or not I got paid for coming, too. Uh, and I think I lose. I hope I lose, in a way. But, uh, and <coughs> that, that's democracy. Uh, now, Tom, uh, in his material, is very hostile to the past and big government and things like that. So apparently he would want to apply democracy on a, a small scale, uh, say 501 people, or me and my neighbors, or whatever. Uh, that may be better or worse, but the logic of it is still the same. Uh, and that logic, uh, unfortunately, uh, does not lead to very pleasant societies, uh, and it does not lead to me actually controlling much of anything, because one vote over everybody is worth a whole lot than all the, less than all the votes over me, uh, to me. Uh, one thing that disturbed me a little bit about Tom's literature, and I guess even what he said today, uh, is his unwillingness to call things by their names. Uh, the ideology he's arguing for is not a new ideology. Uh, it is a rather reputable thing called democratic socialism. Uh, one of my favorite writers, George Orwell, was in that tradition, and I suspect he's a writer who Tom might be fond of too. It does happen to be the official ideology of the ruling parties of Great Britain, West Germany, uh, a number of other societies that do not look very much like utopia. Uh, and it may be that there are some points in which Tom really isn't a democratic socialist, but after reading through his material at some length, uh, I can't find any, uh, other than the fact that he wants to call it new economic, new econo no, economic democracy, Dem uh, economic democracy, I think, or new economic democracy, or something like that instead. Uh, the odd thing about democratic socialism, uh, uh, democratic socialists will tell you correctly, I think, that 
the various social democratic parties of Europe aren't really socialist, they've sold out to somebody or other. The odd thing is, is the very rare circumstance under which one observes real democratic socialism. Real democratic socialism is only observed in countries which do not permit reporters except those who like the government. Uh, for instance, the Soviet Union in the 1920s uh, was uh, under Stalin and earlier under uh, Lenin, uh, was a real democratic socialism. It became, the 1920s Soviet Union became undemocratic uh, a few years later when we found out more about it. Uh, and nowadays, of course, uh, China is uh, true democratic socialism. Uh, I don't know whether Tom, I'm sure Tom doesn't like Stalinist Russia, and I don't know whether he likes, likes China or not. Uh, that's one of the odd characteristics of true democratic socialist societies uh, as they exist in the real world. The other is they generally won't let their citizens leave. Uh, and that does apply to China uh, today. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why modern liberalism, perhaps a halfway house, uh, why it behaves in ways that most of us don't like. Uh, why this system, unfortunately, uh, seems to lead to uh, unpleasant and oppressive societies, even though it is supported by people who probably support it because they believe it leads to very attractive societies. So in a sense, what I'm really talking about is the consistency of, of socialism or liberalism or whatever mix of the two you like. Now, one of the central ideas, as I see it, is the idea uh, that a socialist society accepts interdependence and accepts, therefore, the fact that on the one hand, I have an obligation to poor people, a real enforceable obligation, if they're poor, I ought to be taking care of them. Uh, and unfortunately, there are certain consequences that come from that. Uh, in effect, what, what the socialist is saying is we have certain common resources. And if you follow the logic of the argument, which many people won't do, uh, many of those resources are human. Uh, the society has three plows, 17 acres of land, two peasants and a doctor. Uh, and if it's really the case uh, that we should democratically decide what's being done, then what happens to any of those resources is the concern of all members of the society. Uh, that means that if one of those resources chooses to poison himself by consuming heroin or cocaine, uh, it is reasonable within such a society for the others to say, you are damaging our common property. If you are not productive, uh, you cannot take care of the helpless poor who, who might depend on you. Furthermore, if you become sufficiently unproductive, we will have to take care of you. Therefore, there no longer are any self-regarding actions, as Mill put it. There no longer is any region of individual freedom, logically, in a democratic socialist society. Uh, now, I'm certainly not saying that Tom Hayden believes he's against individual freedom. I don't know if he believes that or not. Very likely he doesn't. Uh, what I am saying is that the logic of the system he wants to establish, not the results he wants, but the system he wants to establish, that logic is unfortunately inconsistent uh, with individual freedom. Uh, there's a very moving uh, essay by Orwell, by the way, which is a joint review of the, ro of the road to serfdom and a book by a far-left uh, British writer, Kony Ziliakis. Uh, and what Orwell says is, uh, if Professor, Zili Professor Ziliakis argues that capitalism necessarily leads to monopolies, great depressions, and so forth, somewhat along the lines of what Tom uh, believes in, uh, Professor Hayek argues that socialism necessarily leads to totalitarianism, oppression, slave labor camps, and so forth. It is a sobering thought that they may both be right. Uh, he may have been the last open-minded socialist, I don't know. Uh, well, I believe only one of them was right, of course. I don't know <coughs> which, if any, Tom believes were right. But, uh, but I am suggesting that there is some reason why societies uh, which have a heart, which believe that everybody is entitled to a decent wage, uh, which believe in taking care of the poor, must also believe that you are not entitled to use drugs which will injure you, that you must wear a safety helmet, that you must wear seat belts, uh, and many other propositions of this sort. Now, it's true, many liberals are in favor of legalizing certain drugs, but those are the drugs that they don't think hurt you. Uh, marijuana, for instance. Uh, there are very few of them, uh, I don't know about Tom, 
uh, who of course doesn't call himself a liberal or a socialist at the moment. Uh, there are very few of them who are in favor of legalizing thalidomide, even to people who have informed consent and know what they're doing. <coughs> legalizing heroin, uh, legalizing laetril, uh, legalizing essentially any, anything which anybody wants to do with his own body. Saccharin's a fine example. <laughs> the, because uh, ultimately their position leads you to the conclusion that it isn't your body. Uh, now there's another point connected with this, and I, I said a few minutes ago that one of the characteristics of the true socialist, democratic socialist societies uh, was they didn't let people out. Uh, well, there's a reason for that too. I mean, after all, people can't be allowed to walk off with a state resource. Uh, and it goes both ways. Uh, I would say one of the least defensible characteristics of uh, our present set of institutions, uh, characteristics which Mr. Hayden, from what he has written, appears to approve of, is the fact that we believe that America is a closed preserve, which we are willing to let a trickle of, other, of, of nasty foreigners into, but that basically they belong there and we belong here. Uh, and in uh, Tom's campaign literature, he specifically suggested a readjustment uh, of the immigration quotas, which I think leads to the reasonable inference that he's not in favor of abolishing them. Uh, well, why? If you take the position that we have an obligation to clothe the naked and feed the hungry, well, if they're on the other side of the border, we don't have to worry about them. But if they come in and get sick, get, get sick and hungry, then they're uh, coming out of our pockets, so we better shove them over there. Uh, and that's the way our society works. And I don't think it's coincidental that the, the end of unlimited immigration in this country roughly coincided with the rise of, of the central government. Uh, well, I guess I believe that there are many millions of people out there uh, who would rather be allowed to come into an America without welfare than be kept out of, a, of America with welfare. Uh, and Tom presumably believes he's an egalitarian. Well, most of those people are an awful lot poorer than the American poor. Uh, and I don't know quite what his grounds are for keeping them out, or whether he really believes that he just didn't say he was in favor of letting them in because it was a campaign statement and it might have been unpopular, uh, or what, and he can comment on that when he, when he comes to it. Uh, but I do think it's sort of interesting uh, that, that essentially a libertarian society, a society in which each person is ultimately his own responsibility, and in which, although I may choose to help a starving man, I cannot be compelled to, that only such societies, as far as I know, are willing to freely let anybody come in who wants, as this country did for many years, which is why most of us are here, I think, because of our ancestors, and freely let anybody go out who wants. Uh, and I am rather pleased uh, with that idea, and I think that it would be nice if uh, we could move back towards that sort of a society. Uh, now, there are a few other things that I'd like to say. Uh, I guess uh, <coughs> part of it is, is really a set of challenges to Tom. When he talked about uh, democracy, the nearest he came to defining it was when he talked about a system which is good for the majority. Now that, unfortunately, is an outcome, not a system. Uh, I presume he believes that in the most literal, formalistic sense, our system is a democracy. If you've got a sizable majority, you can elect the guy you want president, the people you want to the Senate and the House, and so forth. And yet, nonetheless, he obviously believes that the system does not serve the interests of the majority. It seems to follow from that that the formal institutions we call democracy are no guarantee of the outcome of serving the uh, the majority of people or anybody else. Uh, I think he believes that. He ought to believe that, uh, and it's true. Uh, and I hope he believes, as I do, that democracy in the sense of majority vote is merely a means, an instrument. It may lead to good results, it may lead to bad results, and it must be judged only uh, on those grounds. There is nothing essentially just about oppressing people by majority rule. Uh, and I think, therefore, that, the, that the, what 
Tom really has to explain, if he wants to be taken seriously as an intellectual and not merely as a politician, uh, is what his reasons are for believing that he has some way, uh, some uh, procedure, social institutions, or whatever, which actually will serve the majority of the people, which will make government uh, do good things. Uh, now, the other question I'd like to ask him uh, is whether he is or is not a liar about being a decentralist. That is to say, it's very easy to say, I'm in favor of decentralizing all those decisions where I disagree with the decision the central government has already made. Uh, I noticed in his literature that he was in favor of repealing uh, 14b, uh, that is to say, of making it illegal for states to have right-to-work laws. Now, I think much can be said against right-to-work laws. Personally, I'm in favor of both union shops and yellow dog contracts being legal. A yellow dog contract is a contract in which an employee agrees not to join a union, and it is called that by people who don't like them on the theory that only a yellow dog would sign one. Uh, however, it does seem to me that if you're going to argue for decentralization as your solution to things, then you ought to say that decisions are made at the lowest possible level, not the highest possible level. And I would, would appreciate it if Tom would tell me uh, whether he would be willing to decentralize minimum wage laws, say, to say that any town or, or community or state which doesn't want to have minimum wage laws doesn't have to, whether he would be willing to decentralize drug laws, any town which believes that it's all right for people to take so-called prescription drugs without a prescription or heroin or anything else, that's all right, whether he's willing to decentralize child labor laws, usury laws, uh, and in fact any place, any other set of laws uh, which he approves of the way the federal government is doing them now. Now, I may get a surprise. Uh, the last time I tried this experiment, the man I was talking to was Paul Goodman, and his answer was a modified yes. Uh, but Paul Goodman was not a socialist. Uh, he was an anarchist. He was really one of our people, even if a rather strange and peculiar variant of our people. Uh, and I hope Tom is, but I don't think he is. Uh, I guess one last sort of set of comments about this uh, bogey of monopoly corporations and such. Uh, if I understand Tom correctly, he's saying the 50 largest banks have on average 1% each uh, of the total quantity of deposits. I think he said 50 banks at 50%. And I would say that if the 50 largest banks average 1% each of deposits, uh, that's what I learn to call competition. Uh, it's very far from a monopoly. And that as far as I can see, almost without exceptions, the only effective monopolies in this country that exist or that have ever existed, and if Tom wants to discuss Standard Oil, I will be glad to discuss the real history of Standard Oil. If he doesn't want to discuss it, I refer, of course, to the McGee article, uh, First issue, the first uh, volume of Journal of Law and Economics, which discusses what really happened. But that the only effective, uh, powerful monopolies that have existed in this country have been those which have had their monopoly position guaranteed by government. Uh, if you wish to, <laughs> yeah. as a matter of fact, if Tom bothers to read uh, some of the people on his own side, and I'm thinking now of Gabriel Polko, who he's maybe familiar with, he will discover that the, uh, those nice uh, regulatory commissions which got taken over uh, by the evil interests after being founded by the good guys to control the evil interests were actually founded by the evil interests. Uh, <laughs> that the ICC in particular uh, was created at the desire of a large part, but not all, of the uh, railroad industry. And the reason it was created was that, with one brief exception, and my source now is Colco, who is a socialist, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think an intelligent, interesting man, uh, as Orwell was, and as many socialists are. I mean, brief, brief interlude. <laughs> it, it is a mistake to assume that people who disagree with you are stupid, or that their ideas are indefensible, because then you have an impossible picture of the world in which bright people hold indefensible and stupid ideas. And interlude. Uh, but what, what Polko says essentially was the railroads tried to maintain monopolies according to the best principles which uh, Mr. Hayden believes they ought to do it by, and they were almost uniformly unsuccessful. 
And so they got the ICC put in, and the ICC fixed their rates for them at nice high levels. Uh, the, the airlines did much better for themselves. We were already used to such things, so almost as soon as they got in, they got the CAB for themselves. And, and uh, I think since that date, nobody has established a major interstate airline. Funny thing. Uh, and I think we could all go down the list, all the way down to medical licensing uh, of various government monopolies. So that, I mean, we could have a long argument, but I think that the empirical evidence is not as Tom believes, and as Orwell believed, incidentally, that competition normally leads to monopoly. Uh, competition doesn't normally lead to monopoly for much the same reason that centrally planned socialist economies don't work, uh, a proposition I assume Tom agrees with, because very large firms tend to get inefficient, to have large administrative costs, and so forth. And most of the time, the uh, final economic situation is one with a fair number of firms uh, competing with each other, and even when there are only a few firms, as long as there's no government getting in the way, uh, other firms can enter if, enter if one of them behaves badly. And the last comment to Tom is, you, no uh, businessman can buy a politician 